Hello everyone, this is Norm again. Thanks for joining. I hope your day is going well. I hope the weather is favorable for you. And if it's not, get working on it. Take the initiative. Over here in Normland, I'm just getting my head back together after a uh, rough week, so no long introductions, I'm just gonna jump right into it. So last week, I had intended to do a long and thoughtful piece about the death of the Electronic Entertainment Expo. And just as I was about to record it, there was a windstorm and I lost power for pretty much the entire weekend. And quite frankly, as much as I am unhappy about the death of E3, I feel more strongly about sitting in darkness with only my sea monkeys to entertain me. They're not that interesting. They don't take to training well, the fire hoop trick went really badly. In any case, right now power is back on and E3 is still dead, so today I am going to give you my thoughts on the death of this cornerstone event for the video game industry. Where do we start with E3? Honestly, uh, as far back as I can remember, uh, at least as far back as I was actively following video games in any sort of uh, fan capacity, reading magazines, remember when there were video game magazines? That was a good run. But as far back as there was any kind of real media coverage of the video game industry at all, like even in the days of AOL news groups, E3 was always there, often at the periphery and uh, in the early primordial days. Well, okay, in the uh, in, in complete fairness, in the very very early days, uh, it wasn't even E3. I think they were still relegating the uh, the E3 trades at like CES or other dedicated electronic shows. But its presence was always known. The uh, the idea of a trade show, this annual trade show where they would show off pretty much the uh, the industry's plans for the upcoming year. You'd see it mentioned in passing on uh, inside the video game news articles. They'd reference anonymous reports coming out of electronics trade shows. Basically, from a fan perspective, what you had was this kind of mythic thing off in the distance where people were getting a glimpse into the future of video games. Now, it wasn't always, uh, it wasn't always forefront on the radar. That is, uh, you didn't see a lot of real media coverage in the early days of the trade show specifically for a couple of reasons. The, the first one was that E3 in its very early days, well, it was a trade show and, um, uh, I realize that if you've uh, if you've been following it for like the last ten years or so, you know it's a trade show. It was uh, it was a trade show up until uh, 2017. That is an industry only event. But when I'm talking about the early days of E3, you need to understand that I'm talking about a real trade show. Like uh, in the in the last couple of years of it, if you watched E3, you were seeing these lavish, incredibly expensive multimedia events. Guys jumping out on stage. There are celebrities. There are explosions. No, in the early days of E3, there was a stage and there were video game trailers. So that cool content was there, but it was not packaged for mass consumption. Yes, you'd get to see a new trailer for, like, Sonic Adventure or Resident Evil 2, but you could also expect that to be broken up with, like, a 15-minute PowerPoint presentation about how well Ridge Racer did that year. You'd still get the occasional guy going, woo, out in the audience, but it would be about, like, stock options. And so, yeah, at the, uh, at the beginning, E3 was a trade-only event in, uh, in both name and practice. What, uh, what eventually changed that was, uh, and quite frankly, what, what probably did eventually kill E3, but what changed this from being a trade-only event was the fact that uh, it had so much general interest for the public at large. Like, complete honesty, I think if they were still doing like 30-minute PowerPoint presentations in the middle of it, that show would still be going on because that show would have never experienced the pressures, the uh, the performance anxiety, and the sheer logistics troubles of the uh, the later E3. But yeah, what, what actually did pull E3 out of uh, being a trade-only event was the fact that so many people found it interesting. The, uh, the news was obviously of great relevance to anybody who was following video games at all, and the knowledge that there was this place out there in uh, in California, this convention center where if you snuck in, you could actually see glimpses of pretty much every 
relevant video game that was going to be coming out that year, that just kind of kept growing and growing inside the, the fanbase consciousness. Because while, uh, while the fans were not privy to its inner workings, they still noticed a significant uptick in video game news, video game trailers around a specific time of year. June and July just sort of became video game season. So, yeah, E3 started becoming more relevant to the average palooka on the streets. By the early 2000s, it was a thing. It was something that your average video game player would be able to uh, recognize by name. You said E3, they knew what E3 was. Of course, like almost everything else, things started moving a lot more rapidly once the internet got involved. Once YouTube was up and running and you got the, uh, the entire trade show, not just the highlights, but the entire trade show streamed to the general public, that was when you started to see the big changes come in. Previously, this was something they were doing in private. They were going in like, like Michael Corleone had his guy slowly shut the door on his wife, the gaming populace out waiting in the hallway while the big men talked inside. Now the world was watching them and they were starting to get feedback. The companies realized uh, at this point that this was kind of a prime marketing opportunity for them. It was a time that they could show off their wares and really build up initial hype for the products. And it was also a time that, uh, aided by the, the helpful comments on the internet, that the E3 press conferences started to get a lot less boring. They, uh, they started having, like, live show coordinators come out and start retooling all the, uh, the excruciating parts. By 2010, you weren't seeing a lot of charts on the, uh, the E3 show floor. In many respects, it started to, uh, to resemble pretty much any other major, uh, broadcast stage show. Musical guests, people standing on stage trying to be personable, lousy jokes, lousy comedians. Hello, Jamie Kennedy. It remained pretty much up until its dying day a, uh, a somewhat awkward mix of personality-less corporate presentation and blatant fan service. They never really did find a comfortable mix for that. It always was... Uh, a little awkward. I have a lot of memories of E3 trying to be relevant to the current video gamer generation by throwing the great spaghetti of pop culture on the wall and not really caring whether or not it stuck. At some point, somebody at Nintendo greenlit DJ Ravi furiously beating invisible drums live on stage for what felt like approximately seven hours, and that was just another part of the show. But, of course, that was also part of the Golden Age. That was the, uh, the height of E3. Because while a lot of the stage shows, while a lot of the presentations were things like that, and people staring awkwardly at the camera, unused to public speaking, not sure what to do with their hands, the other part of it, the part that we really cared about, was the cannon blast of every single relevant game. And if you're coming into this late, if you're, uh, if you're very young, or, or just, you know, haven't really been into the uh, the news side of video games at all, you might take that last statement as hyperbole. And it, and it is a bit of hyperbole. It's uh, Obviously, it's not every single relevant game. But this was, for most intents and purposes, every game that was going to matter in the near future. The industry has changed so much in the last, I'd say, eight years with the availability of almost consumer-level game engine availability, uh, with the multiple channels of distribution, the sheer number of games coming out at any given time, E3 really could have only happened when it did. Because E3, in its golden age, had slowly morphed from a trade show to a marketing show, the emphasis had, uh, had evolved from business strategy to showing off the games, because um, obviously that was what the public wanted. It made for the best presentations, and for a time, it was advantageous to all parties. In the 2010s, when uh, when your average AAA game took about three years to, uh, to produce, it uh, took a from active production to product, turnaround time was going to be topping off more or less around three years. That meant that if you saw a game at E3, either it was going to be on store shelves within two years, or, well, like a lot of things at E3, it just won't come out at all. But because of that, that worked pretty well as a good burst of initial hype for any, uh, any game showing off at E3. 
the game was in people's minds. They could do a couple other drops on it in the next uh, next year or so. And then it was out on store shelves. Everybody went home happy. It made a lot of sense in those days for the companies to put on a good presentation. However, this approach uh, had some downsides, which became much, much worse as things progressed, as the uh, industry itself changed and uh, games got more sophisticated, the development time went longer. Right now, in 2023, average development time for a AAA game is somewhere in the range of five to six years. And the way game development works, you can be spending two or three years of that working full steam ahead and still have nothing even remotely presentable for public viewing. Even in the three-year turnaround days, companies were complaining about the pressure of producing a, uh, a decent-looking, presentable demo of their upcoming titles for the stage show. They still did, often uh, resulting in things like CG trailers, like that uh, the Killzone one that was pretty much manufactured out of whole cloth, or uh, the second Cyberpunk trailer is a more recent example. Ultimately, an E3 that was revolving around these kind of reveals started becoming a, a matter of diminishing returns. And that kind of became part of the, uh, the whole problem with E3, which is that E3 was fantastic for people who weren't there, who weren't involved. Like, even when I was industry adjacent, my entire involvement with E3 was getting some wings and watching the press conferences like they were the Super Bowl. From that standpoint, E3 was fantastic. You were getting spoon-fed an absolute buffet of everything that you wanted to play that year. From the company's standpoint, it was pretty much the opposite. They were being compelled by public pressure to regularly put out presentations, demonstrations of products that were clearly not ready to show, massive amounts of work to make a vertical slice uh, playable, and not just playable, but look like a finished game, in some cases years away from release, sometimes months spent on just this demo, which ultimately gets two minutes of airtime in competition with everything else on stage. I mean, let's be honest, we, we remember the reactions to, like, the Final Fantasy VII Remake announcement. People literally crying with joy, folks embracing peace treaties being signed, but nobody remembers the trailers for Space Worm Simulator or Cat Rancher. I'm assuming Cat Rancher isn't a real game, it actually sounds fun. In any case, the companies eventually had enough. Nintendo was the first one to bow out. They, uh, they still did a uh, presentation, but they did it pre-recorded and it eventually morphed into the Nintendo Directs. Sony bowed out about a year after that and started doing their state of plays. Microsoft was really the lone holdout for the big E3-style presentations. And it sounds like they're actually going to be still doing a, uh, a, a similar presentation this year, just not in direct uh, correlation with E3, but I would not be super surprised to see them start adopting the other format as well, which is an utter shame from the fan perspective, but I can't say I don't understand it. And I know talking about this, I haven't really gone into any depth on uh, the, the company behind E3, the ESA, but that's mostly because they were never really the heart of the, uh, of the show. The heart of the show, the part that everybody still remembers, or everybody who has fond memories of E3, what they're latching onto, what the nostalgia is for, that, my friends, was a case of the right place at the right time. Uh, Jeff Keighley's show, the, the new Summer Games Fest, it's being touted as a kind of E3 replacement. It, it always, I mean, that was sort of its whole thing, was to kind of come up and take the place of a lot of the uh, former pomp and circumstance of the E3 show. It's fine, it, it is what it is, but you're never going to get back that magic combination of, of E3 that we saw in the mid-2010s. That was not the case of a talented show organizer, that was the case where all the cosmic cards just fell in the right order. It was great while it lasted. Anyway, to finish up today on a uh, slightly more positive note, here are some exciting E3 facts from happier times. Did you know that E3 was not always held at the Los Angeles Convention Center? In 1997 and 1998, the E3 organizers failed to negotiate a deal with the Los Angeles Convention Center to hold the, uh, hold the expo there, and as a result, for those two years, they held the expo in Atlanta, Georgia. 
Unfortunately, the Georgia Expos had dramatically lower turnout than the LA ones, possibly because all the developers were lined up at the LA Convention Center outside the doors, just kind of wondering what's going on. Anyway, after that, they moved back to the West Coast, and that was the permanent home of E3 until its untimely demise. As a uh, side note, on the year before all that, 1996, uh, there actually was an E3 event held in Japan. But uh, that one didn't go so well either. Nintendo was the only uh, major publisher to attend, so they decided heck with that one. However, even back on the West Coast, E3 still experimented with a couple of alternate venues. In 2007 and 2008, because several exhibitors felt that E3 was becoming a bit too sprawling, E3 was rebranded as the E3 Media and Business Summit, the most boring branding that was available to them at the time, and just in case that was still too exciting, they held the event at the Santa Monica Airport. For unknown reasons, this format did not stick around. Okay, that is all the time that we have for today. Uh, once again, I'm Norm. I thank you very much for making it all the way to the end of the show with us. And if you like the show and you want to hear more of it, then uh, go ahead and hit the subscribe button and also hit the notification button because the way YouTube's algorithm works is if you don't, you will never see us again. If you want to go above and beyond in your support, you can also join our Patreon at the address in the description. Early access, exclusive goodies, that sort of thing. Other than that, thanks for listening, and y'all take care. Normal way. Like the video, video gamers? We have more such wonders to show you, and all you have to do is subscribe and hit the notifications button. I mean, you don't have to. Also consider becoming a patron by following the link to our Patreon page, where we turn your cash into videos, comics, and games using the darkest of dark magics. But mostly just cash.